Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. So today I want to talk about the birth control pill yet again. Um, and this is because I'm just seeing more and more women these days in my practice who are being put on the birth control pill for reasons other than trying to control getting pregnant or not getting pregnant. And I just want to talk about kind of the implications of that. What are, what are these underlying hormone dysfunctions that are happening that we're trying to suppress by going on birth control pill and basically what that could be doing to your body, et cetera, et cetera. So today I have the lovely Dr. Jolene Brighton. Jolene, let me just pull my thing up because I lost it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Dr. Jolene Brighton is a functional naturopathic medical doctor and nutritional biochemist with a focus in women's endocrine health. She is recognized as a leading expert in post-birth control syndrome and the long-term side effects associated with hormonal contraceptives. Dr. Brighton is the author of Beyond the Pill, a 30-day plan to support women on birth control, help them transition off, and eliminate symptoms of post-birth control syndrome. She is a speaker, women's Women's health advocate and a medical advisor for one of the first data-driven apps to offer women personalized birth control recommendations. So welcome, Dr. Jolene Brighton. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. So I love everything that you stand for, but I just, can you tell us why you are just so passionate about birth control pill? For women because I know you have a bit of a story of yourself don't you <laughs> oh totally like you know it's something I think as we begin this conversation really important for women to understand that I'm not anti-birth control in mm -hmm. fact I used it for 10 years myself it was a tool I used to control my reproductive health and my periods and my period problems uh, that enabled me to become a first generation college student and I went all the way to being a physician and so for that I am very grateful that I had this tool available but, you know, I had my own struggles while on hormonal birth control. And I write about those in my book. And as I came off of birth control, I developed what I've now termed post-birth control syndrome. At the time, I thought I was the only one who lost her period, developed cystic acne, and had a whole host of problems with stopping birth control. But once I got into my clinical practice, I came to observe that the majority, if not all of women struggle in some way to break up with birth control. And as we're going to talk about today, it will be very obvious why when you understand how birth control works and what it does in the body. And it was through working with my patients one-on-one, -on -one, I got the reputation as the doctor who believed women's birth control stories and the doctor who talked about things we weren't supposed to talk about. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we were still not supposed to question birth control. And I was hit with a lot of resistance where people were like, if you're questioning birth control, you're questioning a woman's right to reproductive freedom. That's not what we're doing here. We're asking the question, why is it that we've allowed a medication to be introduced generation after generation of women without ever questioning the long-term consequences and impacts? And why is it that we're all told it's safe when we're lacking data on some of these things that we're told it's safe regarding? Why is it some of us have side effects where others have no issues? Why is it one woman starts birth control and it's the best thing that ever happened to her and another woman, it completely wrecks her life? These are the questions we need to be asking and these are the answers that we need. But so many of us end up on birth control for symptom management with no question as to why we have those symptoms and no true informed consent. And that's what I'm really passionate about. Um, at this time in you know, the United States, there are still states where if a woman is sedated, put under general anesthesia, you are allowed to perform a gynecological exam. You can practice penetrating this woman with a medical device without her consent. And these are the things that need to change in women's medicine. We need more medical freedom. We need more informed consent, and we need women to have the information they need to make that decision for themselves and to be able to give consent. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> to all of that. I love it. Yeah. I'm a bit of a, like a hardcore feminist myself deep down inside. So I do get really angry about this. I myself was put on birth control at 14 and it was just like the normal thing to do. My mother mm -hmm. marched my sister and I into the doctor's office. It was like, here you go. Here's your birth control pill. And I rapidly gained weight. I literally thought I was losing my mind. Like I remember mm -hmm. sitting on my chair, bawling my eyes out thinking, I think I'm a crazy person. 
I need to go to an insane asylum. That's what I was thinking at the age of 14 because I really thought my emotional, like, I was so, so emotional and losing my mind. And I yeah. did not know. And nobody said, oh, maybe it's the birth control pill. Mm -hmm. And I would like, if I missed it, if I missed taking it at the exact mm -hmm. same time every day, I would vomit. Yeah. I'm like this went on for over a year before I finally I was like, I've got to get off this. Not want my mother, my doctor. Nobody said, Oh, maybe you're having a funny reaction to birth control. Mm -hmm. No, and it's like, who does that? How do you guys not see and be like that that there wasn't that correlation, right? And I can I think of how many women out there have no idea that the symptoms that they're experiencing are because they're on birth control. Mm -hmm. And I'd love it if you could tell us, just can you list off some of the symptoms and maybe not, and maybe some of the ones that aren't so common that we might think of, like that could be caused by long-term use of birth control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just want to say like to your mom's credit, she thought she was doing oh, the best totally. thing for you. Yes. And, you know, very much so there's generations of women who went before us that were expected to be good girls, who I'm doing air quotes for people who are only listening, who never question anything, that you don't question the authority, you don't question the doctor in the white coat. That's part of why my book is dedicated to those little girls who ask those questions, who were told they talk too much. We need more of that. We need more troublemakers in this world mm -hmm. because the reality is, is that so many of us are told things like, no, your side effects, you know, those, those, it's in your head. Like those, those don't have studies to back them up. What you're experiencing, there's no study to prove it. Therefore, your experience is not real. That makes zero sense. <laughs> that makes no sense at all. And, you know, what you were speaking to is one of the side effects that is now being, you know, it's more and more being validated by science. But for women listening, if a doctor says to you, there's no study showing that birth control causes mood symptoms. True. There's no study. There's only thousands upon thousands. We're talking hundreds of thousands of women who've reported this since the introduction of birth control. It's in the package insert. And there are studies showing a strong correlation. I don't think we need to wait around for science to validate women's stories. And in fact, there have not been robust, extensive studies on the effect of hormonal birth control on the female brain. So let that sink in. We did trials with birth control in the 1950s. It was released to married women only in the 1960s. This is why people get a little hot and bothered by it. And then the 1970s, we finally started seeing more women getting access, but that's also when women started to rise up and question, what the heck is this drug doing in our body? for which marketing came in, lots of things shifted. Yes, hormonal birth control was an instrument and a tool that helped propel women forward. However, in all of this time of birth control's history, we've done very little research with regards to the long-term impact on the female brain. Here we are in 2019, and I'll say a, an article just came out in Scientific America with a PhD doc backing up what I've been saying for years and been called crazy and uh, you know anti-women for saying, which is that, this is a huge experiment. It's the biggest uncontrolled experiment done in human history to generations of women. Wow. And what you experienced is one of those known side effects that women go through. And as a teenager, we have now come to understand that teenagers are at the highest risk of these mood changes and suicide risk. In fact, you know, even after have the risk of suicide. And we, for a long time, thought it was all that estrogen, the synthetic estrogen was the problem. But as it turns out, the synthetic progestin is a problem as well. Did you lose me there? I did, but that's okay. You're back. <laughs> okay. If you need me to repeat something, let me know. <laughs> okay. I have a conspiracy that Portland's trying to push the 5G. And just in the last few weeks, my internet's being weird, even though I have Google Fiber. <sighs> And I'm like, I swear they're trying to push me into one. I, I don't doubt it. You're right. Yes. <laughs> it's like, what do I know about that? That's just my conspiracy. Of like, I believe it though, hundred percent. Yeah. I'm like, in the last few years, everything's been fine, and now all of a sudden, in like the last handful of weeks, I my internet's cutting out all the time. I don't know. So anyhow, um, you know what I wanted to say about that though is um. Uh, it's really common practice, I think, in people's minds to vilify estrogen. Estrogen's not bad. When we're mm -hmm. talking about birth control, this is synthetic estrogen and synthetic progestin. You make progesterone. Mama Nature makes progesterone. Only labs make progestin. Nowhere in nature do we see progestin. 
And this is important because what we found is that women who take hormonal birth control, so this was in the 2016 study that came out out of Denmark looking at over a million women, you're taking the combination pill, that's the most common, estrogen mm -hmm. and progestin, you're 23% more likely to be prescribed an antidepressant. However, when we talk about the progestin only pill, that's 34% more likely to be prescribed an antidepressant. And this is because progestin actually alters the female brain. It changes it structurally. It may well change our neuroplasticity and it may upregulate immune cells to make more reactive oxygen species within the brain. I don't know about you, but nobody talked to me about this before I started no, birth control. Not. Or that, you know, birth control is creating neurotoxins in the brain, which is why, mm -hmm. you know, women can have an array of symptoms that come up, like brain fog, new onset of headaches, migraines, and anxiety, depression, mood swings, irritability, all of these mood symptoms can come up as well. Now, other things that aren't talked about that I go over in my book is the impact on our microbiome. So those mm -hmm. good gut bugs that once upon a time medicine said were a bunch of freeloaders and now we've come to understand they're just about everything when it comes to health. Keep that in mind, women. This is one more place where medicine got it wrong and now is discovering new things. They... <clears throat> I am confident that, you know, in the next 10 years, we're going to look back at women's medicine and be like, that was so archaic. What were we doing? <laughs> because women are rising up and they're asking, yes. they're demanding this change that needs to happen. So alterations in the microbiome, uh, similar to what we see with antibiotics in terms of decreasing microbial diversity and putting you at risk for yeast overgrowth, yeast in your mouth, yeast in your gut, yeast in your vagina, and yeast on your skin. So it can show up any way that yeast infections do thrush in the mouth, yeast overgrowth in the gut. You can see yeast vaginitis and you can definitely see yeast conditions on the skin as well. Like toenail fungus can mm -hmm. be an issue and that can be also linked into what's happening on the metabolic level. So we know hormonal birth control induces um, insulin resistance and it's inflammatory. So we see- How does it induce insulin resistance? So anything that's inflammatory will cause your cells to become more rigid and less accepting of what is what you know what hormones you're trying to dock there. So okay. we can see insulin resistance, thyroid resistance, cortisol resistance coming up while you're on hormonal birth control. But in addition to that, because it alters the microbiome, which is where you know our immune system lives in our gut, it can cause inflammation in the body in that way. And so that's just another mechanism of causing inflammation. There may be a link as well with what's going on with the microbiome, the effect on that, and how that links into blood sugar regulation as well. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of that, it also causes genetic and structural alterations within the liver. And so your liver is a major organ along with your adrenal glands in controlling your blood sugar. It's not just all about the pancreas. So um, like we're all like, oh, pancreas, yeah. insulin, yeah. But there's also the cortisol and the glycogen and uh, you know uh, glucose pathways that happen through the liver as well. And so there's a lot of ways that hormonal birth control touches the body. In fact, it touches every single system in the body. And uh, I think it's really silly. I mean, it just makes me giggle. I, I mean, that's what keeps me from getting mad <laughs> because I'm like, when doctors are like, well, this medication is only designed for your reproductive system. So therefore, it only impacts your reproductive system. And it's like, well, that's a cute idea. Except that we have receptors all over our body for hormones and you can't affect one hormone without affecting all hormones. Um, yes. And you know, your ovarian adrenal thyroid access in women is so, so crucial to our overall health. So what happens when you take out the ovarian function? Like, let's talk like hormonal birth control, the pill specifically works by shutting down brain ovarian communication. And this is where there is disrespect in women's medicine. And I would argue that we haven't had respect in women's medicine from the get-go. And we are only now as women in a position, we're educated enough, we are the majority of healthcare providers, that we can now call this out for what it is. But why is it that medicine thinks our reproductive system as women is negotiable as if this is a system we don't need? Like, oh, just take birth control. Just shut all that business down. This, you know, my good friend, Dr. Lara Brighton, she's, you know, the first person I heard say this and she's 100% right. It is chemical castration that's tolerated because we are feminine. We are viewed as the lesser by the masculine paradigm of medicine, which is what is an... I'm going to get a little bit out there for a second, but if we look at the energetics of masculine and feminine, like I would argue that naturopathic philosophy is the feminine. It is 
how do we remove the obstacle to allow the body what it was designed to do? Because your body has an inherent knowledge and it can do this. And we hold space to honor nature, to honor the progress, to ask why, and to have curiosity and to also view that your body is not dysfunctional. It is adapting. What is the adaptation? Whereas that more masculine, that young energy is, let me come in and make you submit. You have symptoms, I'm going to shut down your entire system. You have acne, let me just shut down your reproductive system. And there is a time and a place for every energy, right? If you get in a car accident, you don't want that feminine energy coming in being like, how do we hold space for your body to heal? You want that yang energy that's like, I'm going to clamp that artery right now that's bleeding. I'm going to come in. I'm going to have like, I'm going to make your body do what it needs to do to survive. Neither is bad. Neither is the best. Like it is the best tool for the best time. So it's a yeah. Time I think it's like feminine is that that energy, that warm energy. We're creative. I mean, that's the the right side of the brain, and then left side of the brain is more clinical and linear and going. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve it now. Yeah. So it's not bashing men. This isn't like a man to a woman. Oh no. Many female doctors who are who are applying birth control pill, but <laughs> well, um, we both have the energy. Right? Like men yes, yes. both have masculine and feminine. Just to energy. clarify that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like just like the earth has the sun and the moon. The sun is very young, it's yes. masculine energy, and it has the moon, the feminine energy. And each shine when it's their time and each serve a purpose. And life couldn't mm -hmm. go on without both of these. So it's not and I think I like to use this analogy because I think we like to we like to vilify and compartmentalize. At least we do that in the United States where it's like I'm on the winning team and this is right. And this is the only thing that's right. And it's like, I hate to break it to you, but like nobody's right all the time and nobody's wrong all the time. And it's all about like, you know, having the tools that you need when they're available. I use the analogy of the tool shed. Like just because you hate hammers doesn't mean when you need a hammer, you go to the tool shed and you pull out a saw. Like, no, that's not going to get the job done. You need a hammer. And I think a medicine that way as well. Just because maybe you might be thinking, I hate hormonal birth control, it doesn't mean that it's not a tool that can't be utilized by somebody else and that there isn't a time and a place. Like, you know, if you have extremely heavy, heavy periods and, you know, we can't get ahead of your iron stores and you're looking at like, yo, if this keeps going, it's a blood transfusion time bringing in birth control and shutting down the cycle for a couple of cycles while you build up iron stores and do that work and then help that woman transition off may be the best tool at that time, given her life circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's frustrating because I look back on my fertile years and think, man, there were so many times I would have, oh, I wished so bad I could have taken the birth control pill. I didn't like condoms, right? They're very irritating to, 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 to the area, to the yeah. vagina for Well, me. these days there's so many condoms out there. Like I'm going to date myself for a second, but like 10 years ago, it was like lame, 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 all the lame <laughs> condoms. And I have a latex sensitivity. So the same. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Yeah. Latex sensitivity, add friction. And it is like, it's you can't not walk. Fun. It's no. not fun. It is and, burning um, down there when that totally. happens, right? But now there's like all of these condoms out there that are like, green condoms, clean condoms, all the wonderful condoms. And I'm like, yes, why can't we do this with other forms of birth control too? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I tried it all. I mean, I did, I had the diaphragm. That was probably the best, which you go into a doctor. I remember them looking at me like, what? You want a diaphragm? Like that's so There are totally women that. You, you know, know, I talk about that um, when it comes to alternatives because people yeah. are like, what's the one alternative that works for everyone? And I'm like, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Is, there's no one size fits all. That's, you know, that's the burden of individualized medicine. Sorry guys. Um, but with that, like I talk about that, like for me, the idea, like, and I, I am seriously, my love language is acts of service. When you know that about me, cuddling doesn't do it for me. I don't care if we hold hands or not. Yeah. Oh, just a second. You're, you're um, freezing out. Your love language and you don't Am I back? <laughs> You're back. You're back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So to the point of diaphragms though, like I, I was just having this discussion and women were asking like, what's the one thing? And um, I gave the example, like for me, if it's the end of the day and I'm tired and I'm like, oh, I want to have sex and I know how awesome an orgasm can be. 
but I got to go put in a diaphragm. I'm probably going to pass on that because I just know myself. Yet there are other women, they've had patients who are like, oh, my, like my husband's coming home and I'm putting the kids to bed right before I do bedtime routine with the kids. I put my diaphragm in, then I'm good to go afterwards. And it like totally works for them. And they're like, this is the best thing ever. And so there is no one size fits all. It's, and that's where we get ourselves in trouble in medicine is where we think that we can just apply every single thing to every single woman, but even worse, you guys, all the research, like up until a couple decades ago, was on men. And they would say, okay, I studied a man, and this was the male outcome. Therefore, women, that's just the same. I'm like, whenever I read the research, I'm like, how can we be the same? We are the creators of life. We not only like can like create a human in our body and gestate that, but we go on to be able to create our own food supply, like their food supply for them. Like we do complex things the male body can't even can't dream do. about. Yeah. Like they have no idea. Again, it doesn't make them lesser. And I and I just want to like speak to this for a second because I know when I talk about like masculine, feminine. There's always this woman who misunderstands me and she's like, you're a man hater and you hate all men. I get these comments and I'm like, well, that would be really unfortunate given that I married one and I birthed one and like <laughs> that live with two. Um, plus I just got a boy dog. So I'm totally outnumbered in my house. Um, it's something where I'm like, I'm not anti men. The problem is, is that we always want to be like the battle of the sexes. Who's better? Nobody's better. Everybody has mm -hmm. their superpowers and their talents. I just watched the Avengers this weekend. Like, would you be like, oh, Scarlet Witch, she's like way better than Captain America? I would because I'm biased. But really, their superpowers have a time and a place. And it's really great that like we have, we have the array of superpowers. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more about we just need to find the balance. I think women have come too far on the feminist side with some things where we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot with so much stuff as far as we're trying to do everything now. Yeah. And it's like, we need to find some balance here between what's, what, a, a, what a man's job is and what a woman's job is. And that looks different for everybody. And there's totally. balance to that. Yeah. But how do we that. learn? We always learn from the pendulum swinging too far one way, too totally. far the other way yeah. until we get in the middle. And that's something I think people have a hard time wrapping their head around about me is that I'm not, the pendulum has not swung. Like it has not swung one way or another as I set out to write this book and the work I'm doing. Cause I went through all that as a teenager and in my twenties, I got that mm -hmm. out of my system. I was like, I'm going to control my a period and like, oh, this pill's the best thing. I'm not going to have a period for like two years because I can. Oh, yeah. And my period makes me the lesser and all this stuff. And like, now that I'm like, oh, I have like a decade of periods left and I have finally figured out like how to work with my cycle and work with my hormones. And I'm like leveraging these superpowers I have. And I'm like, great. Now I'm going to go through menopause. And I'm going to have to figure out all the new superpowers. Yeah. You do have new superpowers. You definitely do as that wise woman. And yet I'm like, oh, like if I just spent my twenties, like not thinking I knew better than my body. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the pill gave us sexual freedom. It did. It gave us, it put the ball back in our court where we could control our own bodies of whether or not we got pregnant. Like that was a super powerful time. But mm -hmm. like I said, some things we've come too far on the other side of things, which is now periods are looked at as dirty. Mm, uh, you know, everything, yeah. you know, I remember reading about this stuff, like how all of the, our period pads are white. Our, our tampons are white and it's like soiling them. It's like, why didn't we make them dark so that they don't, they just blend in it. Like I remember and, hearing all this stuff. And the commercials use Windex to represent our period. Cause like I'm an avatar creature or something that bleeds blue. Like what is that? Yes, even about? Exactly, right? Yes. Yeah, no. And it's subtle, yeah. it's subtle period shaming and it's totally. subtly shaming the feminine. But I also, you know, we have always known we've always known how to control our reproductive health. Like, and this was something that was passed on. It's now called fertility awareness method. Like we've always had this, but somewhere along the lines, better living through chemistry came our way. We were told that as women, that we were too stupid to understand our cycles, too stupid to control our body, that we needed to rely on pharmaceutical medications. And this is where we swung into that masculine energy big time, where the only way for us to move forward was to completely control our body. Now, as much as hormonal birth control has moved us forward. Now, I started this off by saying, I, I'm the first person in my family to graduate college, the first woman in my family not to get pregnant before age 20, and I became a doctor. Yes, I used hormonal birth control. However, I also have to question, 
how might this have held me back? In that hormonal birth control, while we're on it, actually impacts our fear response. So we are more inclined to engage in riskier behavior, to become addicted to substances, to put us in bad situations, to choose wow. perhaps bad boyfriends because it messes with how we pick up on MHC complexes, immune complexes that are expressed in pheromones that tell us about mate selection. As women, and as humans, we are animals, and animals rely on the subtle social cues of the animals in their tribe and outside of their tribe, and the subtle social cues and just cues of nature altogether. Well, in hormonal birth control, that's blunted. We also yeah. have come to understand that you know, if your natural progesterone and estrogen helps with neuroplasticity, longevity of your brain, immune system regulation within the brain, and hormonal birth control is really doing the opposite of that. So progestin, the synthetic stuff in birth control, may upregulate microglial cells, which are immune cells in the brain, to express reactive oxygen species. Now, the only way to protect about against free radicals and reactive oxygen species are through uh, things like CoQ10, vitamin C, vitamin E, antioxidants which are also depleted by hormonal birth control. So it's a double whammy. So we have to also ask like, yes, in some ways it's helped move us forward, but in what ways may it actually have impacted our brains so that we didn't move faster, we didn't use our, our, you know, our full potential and our full um, capacity. And at the same time, I have this question that I don't have a great answer to. For everybody listening, like this is a hypothesis and I don't have a great answer to it. I'm just raising questions because this is what we do. This is how we get it started with answering them is why is it that women are 66% of Alzheimer's patients. Like, is it because of environmental toxins? Is it because of how we mother and we lose sleep and we don't have tribes and it hits our hippocampus and excess cortisol destroys the brain? Is it because we've been on hormonal birth control and that actually inhibited our brain from getting nourished by these hormones? Likely it's all of the above because everything chronic disease is a multifactorial condition as we understand that these are the kind of questions we have to start answering. And we have to we have to put light, we shine the light on the story first before we can change the story. And when you understand that there's a lot of things that are just stories we've been telling ourselves, like I tell myself the story, I use birth control as a tool to propel my career forward, to be able to do what I do. But in what ways does that story support me? In what ways does that story maybe hold me back? And why I say it in this way is because I also have to remain open and humble enough to understand that maybe in 10 to 20 years, I'm going to rewrite that story and say something completely different of like, it was, it was, it seemed like a necessary thing, but in reality, here's what took place. And so that's just to say that like, it's always okay to look back and say, I made a mistake and today's an opportunity to do better. Yeah. I, re I remember hearing too, and you can tell me if this is true or not, but that there's some women that when they, when they meet their partner, when they're on birth control pill, and then when they go off of it, they no longer like their partner because yep. of the way it changes with the pheromones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I tell a story in my um, book about a patient of mine and um, it was on again, off again with this guy. And how many of my patients I've seen their marriages have ended after they've stopped hormonal birth control. And then they feel guilt and they feel shame. And society is so good at making everything a woman's fault. But with that, you're an animal. You are an animal. Like, and so understand that there are some things that you can't articulate or conceptualize or really understand in your logical self that like are lying in your subconscious. And with that, we select our mates on genetic diversity. So what we want is we want a mate whose genes are as different as ours so that when we make a baby, that baby has a shot at getting the best set of genes. And the MHC complex, which is a protein that presents antigens to the immune system, is what we pick up in pheromones. And what the research has shown us is that women on birth control actually select for mates more genetically similar to them so um, I just watched an episode of New Girl where she like met the guy of her dreams and they like completed each other's sentences and they were best friends. Yes. And then they found out, then they found out they were third cousins. And I was like, I wonder if she's on birth control. That was the first question in my mind. She was attracted to this guy, Robbie. Was Robbie, he on yeah. birth control? Is that what's going on there? Because we actually select for mates that are more genetically similar to us, which then means baby kind of gets the short end of the which 
do your best you can every single day. But with that, we really have to understand, I think you lost me. Mm-hmm. Where'd you lose me at? I can start over if that helps. <laughs> I, um, it was just for a second. So. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that was okay. <laughs> yeah. But just to say that, uh, you know, the other thing that we know is that it, it goes both ways. So often, you know, it comes when it comes to fertility or mate selection, all these issues, we always like, look at the woman, look at the woman. However, there have been research on um, strippers. So women, female dancers, I don't know what the, if there's a PC term for that. So excuse me, I don't know. know. Um, As it comes out of my mouth, I'm like, there's probably some PC way of saying that, but I don't know it. So apologies for what I don't know. Um, But with that, uh, women who are on birth control get tipped less. They make less money than women who are not on birth control. So men are picking up on this Mm -hmm. as well. Um, because when we are naturally cycling leading up to ovulation, we have this increase in estrogen and our, our lips get plump, our fine lines disappear, our body's a little curvaceous and we put off scent that is saying, yo, I'm going, I'm getting fertile. Like you want to get in on this, don't you? And then no, they pick up on that. In primate studies, we've seen, so before they ever released Depo into the general population, they did primate studies and they actually found that, um, you know, it's a very interesting study, but the the alpha male, when they shut down the female's reproductive system with the depo shot, he rejected her. So this was his mate, not interested anymore, goes and nates with other women. Once they put every single primate on depo, he starts masturbating to excess and abusing them and abusing himself and ends up with anxiety. Like no. this is not just oh. a women's health issue. This is yes. a human's health issue. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, that's scary. That's so scary. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, and that's, it, it not only maybe distracts the man, but I mean, one of the known side effects is lack of libido. And so oh, here yeah. we are, we've got, we're, we got our sexual rights now. We got sexual freedom and we don't want to have sex, which the is the sneaky twisted. way it really works. <laughs> yeah, right. Like this is crazy. And then what's the story on, like you would know, have they do I've heard rumors that yes there's been a, ma- a male birth control but it's I read that it had too many side effects which was like a third of the side effects that it caused for women is that true Oh yeah so um I write about that in my book what happened to the male birth control study now I would never advocate for chemical castration of my son my husband or any man um which is essentially what birth control is is you know it's a temporary it's temporary mm-hmm. guys it's not permanent um With that though, what really rubbed me about this is they started this trial. It worked. It worked really, really well in pregnancy prevention in terms of, you know, decreasing, uh, you know, man's ability to impregnate a woman. Uh, But with that, they found that like it was less than 5% of men were complaining of depression. This was... (laughs) This was taken 100% seriously. Oh my God. Less they than said 5%. It. We don't, you know, no. we don't have a study to show causation, but you know, based on these men reporting it, let's shut it down. Now this was the same time that we saw doctors lining up, dismissing the studies, showing the correlation between birth control and depression in women. Oh no, that doesn't happen. Oh, but in a man, yeah, that men tell the truth when it comes to their health. So we're going to believe men. But in the same quarter that they shut down the male birth control trial, they released a new IUD into the market for women that had way more side effects and higher risk of depression was found in that trial. It was something like 20%. I'm, I, like, I'm, I may not be remembering the exact st- statistic, but it was significantly higher than what we saw with men. It was deemed 100% acceptable to provide a woman that and not acceptable for a man to have any decrease in his mood, although he was experiencing an increase in libido. That was one of his side effects that he experienced. But what really came down to was a business decision. So you can't blame them. Like, look, from the medical perspective, yes. Uh, For the feminist perspective, we can get upset. But at the end of the day, this was a business decision. And how did that business decision play out? Well, a man can always walk away from a pregnancy, but a woman cannot, whether she wants, like if she, that's an unintended pregnancy, whatever she decides, that burden of decision is on her and she's got to live with that, whatever that decision was, which is, it sucks. Okay. And like, you know, if you didn't want that baby, that can really hijack your life. So with that though, from the business perspective, they're like, we're never going to get men to take this. If this has decided, they're not going to do it. So why continue the trial? We can't actually make money off of this, but women 
women can't walk away from a pregnancy. So right. let's just keep doing what we're doing, which is why we've seen little iteration on the contraceptives that we have available. And it's one of the you know, end sentences in my book where I call it out and say, it's time for us to challenge medicine to do better. Yeah. Because really they could spin it. Because I know so many men that won't have sex without a condom, for instance. So mm-hmm. it would be, it would apply to those same guys that are determined never to knock up a woman and, and cause they don't want to have to make that. They would never walk away. Right. There are, there are well, the good they, guys, right. They could appeal to those guys, but I get it. Yeah. What happened to us is far more than what happens to them. Like we're, we're the ones that actually have to then grow the baby, decide whether or not we're going to have an abortion. Like the totally. is so much more. And the emotional burden is high and there is not the tribe that used to be here to support us. The interesting thing though is that the men who were in the birth control trial said they would have used it and would have continued with it despite the, despite the side effects. But really, we need less medications that are mood altering and a lot more support because you know what we're seeing in terms of depression, anxiety, um, the mood swings, the irritability, all of these things. I mean, we're seeing it grow and grow. And I am especially sensitive to it because I am a female physician and physicians are killing themselves at the highest rate of any profession right now. I'm watching my colleagues, the statistics just rising in terms of suicide. And we're seeing teenagers are much more depressed than they've been before and they're taking their life. So I say all of this not to scare people, but to say that like, we need, le- we need to less. be introducing less things that alter mood and bringing in more interventions like community and, and fostering these other things to re- really support people's mood overall. And then when someone begins a medication and says, this is not my normal, something's different, we need to listen. We need to listen and we need to honor that. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into just some of the common reasons why women uh, will go on birth control pill when they don't need to be on it. And if you could, and I know that it's going to be different for everybody, but just in your own practice, what you've seen being a root cause, what is the most common root cause of some of these problems so that maybe women, do we just kind of give some light at the end of the tunnel for a woman that says, oh my gosh, if I go off the pill, I'm going to be bleeding every day of my life. And like you Mm -hmm. said, like having to go in for an iron transfusion. So um, starting with that one, like what would be, you know, in a woman's older years, why would she be bleeding super heavy? Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking about a woman who's like 45 or older, um, going into perimenopause and menopause, another place where this is what gets me is how society is like, oh, you're not fertile anymore. You're disposable. Like we don't need you yet. Here are all these women in their fertile years. They need you. They need you. You are the wise woman. You've walked the path before. And what I say, whenever people are like, oh, you're so smart. You're like this guru and all this stuff. I just laugh because I'm like, no, I'm just a little further down the road and I've fallen in on these potholes and I can look back and say, step to the right, avoid Mm -hmm. that pothole. I already went there. And that's what we need. So understand like first and foremost, please value and honor yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to say that because- That's funny. I just did a whole podcast on- transitioning in through perimenopause and I talked about just that like take if you can embrace it it is what they call wise women's which is really cool right Mm -hmm. it is we get wiser totally totally so why are you having all the symptoms that you're having a lot of times doctors will come in with hormonal birth control to try to control a perimenopausal woman's period and hormones that is downright dangerous and there is no science to support them doing that What we do know and what argues against it is that if you are on hormonal birth control six months or longer in your lifetime, you have a 35% increased risk of developing diabetes as you enter menopause. So it's not a good idea to start that then. We know that as we get older, our stroke, heart attack uh, risk goes up. Um, Once upon a time, doctors would say, be on birth control, it protects your bones. Then a study actually came out that showed that they were always wrong about that. Um, Same thing with breast cancer risk. Whoa, well, it's just a mild increased risk. The newer hormones, they're low dose. Therefore, the risk isn't as high. This was said for a very, very long time. A study finally came out and said, you were wrong all the time, doctors. Like You shouldn't have been saying that women, it wasn't true. So 
your risks, the risks, the big scary risks of birth control, they go up as we get older. And so this is something that I do not, in my practice, if you are perimenopause, no, birth, no hormonal birth control during that. We do have to find a way because you can get pregnant. Um, some women do get pregnant. I gasp yes. a little bit. But I, I have a client at 45, she got pregnant. It just scares the crap out of me, but yeah. <laughs> 45. So, yeah, the side effect of getting healthy is getting fertile. We all want to be fertile for as long as possible. I froze. <laughs> did you, did, what did you get? <laughs> you, you got, I got that part. <laughs> the side effects. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had, um, I had a patient at 48 get pregnant because oh, I told her like this, this is the side effect of getting healthy and you need to use condoms. We need to have a backup method. And I remember the phone call and she was like, you're going to kill me because I didn't, I, I didn't take you seriously. And I didn't believe you. And I was like, I'm not going to kill you. Like, because <laughs> you made a mistake. Like, no, I'm not. A, and she was like, you're so upset with me, aren't you? I'm like, it's your life. I'm not upset with you. Like I give you information. You do whatever you want. I'm not your mom. Um, it's like, I'm here to support you. But you know, so with that, there is that possibility. However, understand what is happening as we go through perimenopause. We are stopping ovulation. It is like, it's like um, when a teenager's learning to drive stick shift. It's like, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> like a back and forth of like, let's ovulate. Wait, no, let's not. And so yeah. with that, our progesterone declines. Now, this is where medicine gets it wrong. And some doctors come in and they're like, oh, the answer here is we need to actually give you estrogen. The answer is you actually need progesterone because that progesterone going down, and if you take the quiz in chapter one of my book, you'd be category C, which is that you're not sleeping, maybe you have breast tenderness, you cry over everything. Does Sarah McLaughlin commercial come on with the dogs and you're just crying for no reason? Your progesterone's probably low. Do you, you know, the week before your period comes, you want to A, run away to the woods, B, kill somebody, or C, do all of the above? Your progesterone's too low. And this is where people are like, perimenopausal women are crazy. Well, you would feel crazy too if you didn't have progesterone stimulating GABA. GABA is the neurotransmitter in the brain that puts the brakes on the freak out mode and helps you feel chilled and calm. You also stop sleeping as well. So that's also going to have an impact. So these women often are experiencing estrogen dominance, which is the lack of progesterone. So it can be a relative estrogen dominance or it can be relative plus frank. Frank estrogen dominance is, environmental toxins coming in, stimulating uh, your cells. You're not processing it correctly through your liver. So you'll want to see the birth control hormone detox 101 chapter where I talk about estrogen metabolites in my book. And it also can be like you're not pooping right or your gut bugs are in balance and that's leading to estrogen dominance. And then the worst thing is, is your mitochondrial are declining. This is what happens. It sucks. Do everything you can to take care of your mitochondria. But as you do that, your ability to burn fuel goes down. Your fat cells then plump up. They love to make estrogen. Estrogen loves to make flat fat cells even plumper. Now we're going into more estrogen dominance and fat cells can also produce inflammatory cytokines that hit our brain and make us feel really irritable. So increased adiposity is increased. Uh, we see an increase in interleukin uh, one that hits the brain and makes you feel really cranky and irritable and you don't like people. So understand that all of this can be taking place. And sometimes it's excess estrogen on your blood work that is showing, okay, that's why you're having heavy periods, breast tenderness, you're feeling raging, your, your fingers and feet are swelling. And sometimes it's estrogen metabolites. So if you're working with the doctor, Yes, looking at estrogen, total estrogen is great. Um, as we're in perimenopause, going into menopause, we want to look at estradiol and estrone. So E1 is estrone. That is going to be predominant estrogen as you enter perimenopause, or excuse me, into menopause. Estradiol is the fertile female's estrogen. And we want to look at metabolites. 2, 4, and 16 OHE1 or hydroxyestrone because it's what you're doing with your estrogen that matters. And for women who are listening, I want you to understand that if your doctor takes out tissues, so they cut out an organ of your body, like with a hysterectomy, because there's been overstimulation of the tissue, um, maybe you had fibroids, or they did an ablation where they get rid of the endometrial lining because you were bleeding too heavily that did not address the root cause, that only addressed the symptoms. And it may be 100% necessary in your case. However, no one's accounted for that 16-hydroxy estrone that could be stimulating your cells to go into breast cancer. 
And I don't say this to scare you. I say this so that you can know a whole lot more about your body and safeguard it. And one of the easiest things you can do right now, go eat cruciferous sprouts. Broccoli sprouts, kale sprouts, cauliflower sprouts, eating those can actually help lower the risk of breast cancer and help you optimize your estrogen levels. Yeah, that's great. Because I have so many women that do the ablation and they just think it's the best ever. And I'm like, but that doesn't cure why that was happening. (laughs) And you lose your fifth vital sign. Like you lose. So women, you have to understand that this is a conventional perspective of what like Chinese medicine, naturopathic medicine, like all the really older medicines, which by the way, so you know, conventional medicine, allopathic philosophy is the new kid on the block. Um, So that's why it's still in its learning phase of things. And that's why I'm like, we should slow our roll and be a little bit cautious about making it our golden boy that we put on the pedestal and say, oh, it's infallible because it just got started like yesterday. It's like into its teenage phases. So we got to like, we got to hold that like there's some good in that, but also there's going to be some mistakes made. Um, But just really understanding that ancient philosophies have always regarded the menstrual cycle as being very informative. In 2015, the new kid on the block, allopathic medicine, caught on. ACOG said it's the fifth vital sign. So it's up there with your temperature and like your blood pressure. The ways we know your health, we can gauge your health. It's a barometer. When we get an ablation or a hysterectomy, we lose that We lose that data point. It's a very important data point. Now, if it's already happened, it's happened. Like, forgive yourself, move on, know that there's so much more you can be tracking, but it's also something that like, respect it, because this is one way your body communicates to you that men only wish they had. All this period shaming, it's just because they wish they could get in on this massive creative energy that we have. Exactly. Yes. I had a wonderful woman on that talked just about periods and just how powerful they actually are. And if you tuned into them and actually worked with them, mm-hmm. what it, how much it could change your life, really, because you're working with it rather than against it. It was really quite fascinating. Next um, time someone period shames you, for everybody listening, there's a part in my book where I talk about how your, your menstrual blood is rich in stem cells and there's research using it to regenerate liver tissues when there is liver failure to help people after strokes. They're using stem cells from period blood to heal tissues and regenerate tissues. Like when wow, we say you yeah. create life, like I really want women to understand this, like creating life and just by way of having having the uterus in that sacral chakra space, you are a creative maven. You choose. Do you create a baby? Do you create other things? You are still a creator. And understand that your menstrual blood full of stem cells is also creating and giving life. So it we've so much been focused on like the period as this bad thing, this burden that wah, wah, you didn't get pregnant. And Yes, ovulation is the main event and we want to make babies, but understand that your blood still gives life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the other ones I just wanted to ask quickly about was acne. I I get that all the time. Women don't want to go off the pill because they're so scared their face is going to break out in the zits again. So why, what causes, is there something that like a little hack that you have that could help women with that one? (laughs) Totally. And the other thing too, that uh, if you stay on birth control, you may be at higher risk of developing rosacea. So keep that in mind because that's worse because then you can't have the glass of wine, can't have the cup of coffee, can't get overheated, can't work out without like your face gets, you can't even be under like warm lights or in the sun. And then your face is like, you know, red and there's like veins coming up, like little tiny capillaries. So, but look, if you were put on birth control because of acne, odds are that's going to come back when you stop and that's going to be a necessary process you move through. And it can come back worse. Now, I want you to hear what I'm going to say. Stay with me, okay? That it can come back worse because hormonal birth control actually undermines all the mechanisms that can lead to acne. So um, bacterial dysbiosis in the gut or really overgrowth or undergrowth of anything in the gut can lead to acne. Intestinal hyperpermeability is induced by birth control. That's also known as leaky gut. That can lead to food sensitivities. So that's caused by birth control. It depletes vitamin A and zinc. You need those things to have healthy... uh, skin. It's inflammatory. Uh, What helps acne? Anti-inflammatory. So if you understand this, while you're on birth control right now, you'll want to get into beyond the pill, jump into the two-week liver detox um, and work on that and go and start making that way of eating more of a lifestyle. Before we ever come off of birth control, we always have our backup method so that we don't have an unintended pregnancy. 
But when you're ready to come off, you just repeat that liver detoxification protocol again, and then you know continue the 30 days um, eating program. And the reason for that is because if we don't detox optimally, we'll also end up with acne. And for as long as you're on hormonal birth control, your liver is taking one for the team. And so you have to love up your liver and really support it. So if you know all of this is going on, get on a high quality multivitamin or prenatal now. When would be time to choose a prenatal? If you are one of those women who's losing a lot of blood, your ferritin levels are low, your CBC is not looking too hot, understand your ferritin is your storage form of iron. It will show that you are going towards iron. Doctors only test their way disease to treat. They're not being preventative and proactive enough and you need to get that ferritin test. Am yes. I still here? Yeah, you are. You okay. did break up a little bit. So that's okay. um, do you want me to say it again? Um, no, that's all right. I think okay. because you were talking about ferritin and having, having your ferritin get checked. Yes. Talking yes. about ferritin, that's your storage form of iron. It'll show you way before you become anemic. Now, yeah. you also need to be eating to nourish your gut and nourish detox pathways. So if you have acne now, get the cruciferous vegetables going and make sure you poop every day. Track your symptoms. If you get constipated, expect to see acne a couple days later with that. So you mm -hmm. can start tracking that. And then in terms of like topical applications, so when you have acne, try not to pick it and try not to overdo it with harsh cleansers. Like we think like, oh, the hydrogen peroxide based stuff and the kill, kill, kill. Cause that's very, that's that young masculine energy coming in of like, and yes, there's a time and a place to kill things like, you know, like sepsis, that's a bad thing. We yeah. want to kill those bugs. Um, but with acne, you actually, um, you want to you want to support the floor of your face, so you may actually want to use oil cleansing instead, and then follow up with like a probiotic topical, or even just take like probiotics. I'll put probiotics in my hand with some oil, and I'll apply that to my face at night. The other thing you can do is you can put betonite clay on if you have pustules. So that means you got like whiteheads, even blackheads, and this will work on styes as well, is that you can make a poultice out of um, betonite clay, put it on there until it hardens, and it'll actually draw things out. So rather than popping the zip, you can pull that out. Make sure that you're exfoliating often, and as long as you're putting probiotics on your face, go ahead and take them into your gut as well. Mm -hmm. I always say drop caffeine and dairy. When it oh yeah, to, when it comes to getting the act, getting rid of acne, as well as, and I think this is along the lines of why you should eat cruciferous vegetables. But when my clients are coming off of birth control, I always tell them to take the indole methane, which is, will pull out the estrogens. Do mm -hmm. you use that one too? Yeah, so I actually use DIM. It's in my balance um, product. So we use DIM and then we use the broccoli sprouts. And the thing to know about sprouts, you have to chew them really well and you have to have ample hydrochloric acid if you're ever going to get into DIM. And so that's why mm -hmm. I use DIM. A lot Which of women is, on. That's the same, D and methane. Yeah, yeah. Saying it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, I started going through the whole pathway in my head of like, oh, sulforaphane and I3C and like going through the whole thing. So, but with that, um, if you're doing the sprouts, you have to chew well. And then you have to have adequate hydrochloric acid, which is why we also use the DIM in the balance supplement, because that kind of gets around the fact that a lot of women on hormonal birth control are having gut dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about your book because it's, you, you really go through a number of different, like it's, it's, you, you help women who want to stay on it mm -hmm. as well as how to come off of it. So do you go through all of this, the detoxifications and the foods to eat? Yeah. So uh, you, when you go and get into Beyond the Pill, there's a whole chapter called Taking Back Your Period, which helps you troubleshoot what is your period problem and what could be going on. There's also a quiz to understand which hormone is out of balance in your body, the main troublemaker, as I call it. Right. So you can dial yeah. in your protocol and really individualize it. I take you through liver detoxification, optimizing your gut health and restoring gut integrity. We also talk a lot about thyroid dysfunction, adrenal dysfunction, autoimmune disease, mood issues. Because those are all related, like they can be impacted oh, yeah. by birth control. Well, birth yeah. control can trigger autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And so okay. we have to question like all of us doing birth control and who is the number one person in the population susceptible to autoimmune disease? Women. Yeah. So we're talking about thyroid, adrenal, autoimmune disease. We go into libido, fertility, um, how to restore your mood. And I take you through considerations of metabolic health. So like 
insulin and cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease and what you should know with all of that. Yeah, that's great. I actually just had somebody in my group that just asked me, how do I come off birth control pill? (laughs) So I'm going to give her this as like a pre-preview. I'm just going to send it to her personally and be like, watch this and go get her book. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) I'm going to suggest all the clients that come to me now that need to get off birth control. I'm just going to say, you know what? Just go get the book, Beyond the Pill. That's all you need because you've got, you've just hit every section that means that that is most important, right? When you're coming off of it, because you're also telling us how to get to the root of some of these issues that we were talking about today, like the heavy bleeding and, okay, what hormone dysfunction are you having that you, you know, and that you need to get to the root cause of? So I think that's great. So thank you. So I'm going to put the links in the show notes for anyone that wants more from Jolene Brighton. Um, you can go over to her website and you've got lots of different, you've got lots on your website too, which is great. Lots of information and more content just about the effects of birth control, which is great. So thank you, Jolene, Dr. Jolene Brighton for being on the show today. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the conversation. <laughs> 